All right, welcome everybody to the first live edition of the WellMind podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ben Coles. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our panelist discussion on college student mental health during the pandemic. I've asked uh, three clinicians here that serve our college campus at Bethany Lutheran College uh, in, their, in the Counseling Center to join me this evening uh, to really focus in on uh, answering some questions and having some good discussion around uh, things that college students can be doing uh, to practice wellness and improve their mental well-being. So my panelists tonight um, are Danielle Spurley. Uh, she is a licensed professional counselor. Uh, all of our counselors are from Christian Family Solutions. Um, she's been practicing counseling for the past couple of years here in southern Minnesota. Uh, she works with college-age students. Uh, and does a lot of work with trauma, anxiety, and depression issues. I'm also joined by uh, Joe Lunston, a professional counselor serving here at Bethany Lutheran College and also uh, Martin Luther College over in New Ulm. Uh, he enjoys working with young adults on issues related to uh, family dynamics, depression, anxiety, uh, phase of life issues. And then our last panelist is Ashley Guthmiller, uh, she is finishing up her master's degree in clinical mental health counseling here in Mankato at Minnesota State University. Uh, she's been interning with Christian Family Solutions and serving the college campus here as well as doing outpatient counseling work. So I'm really excited to have them uh, with us tonight. Uh, and I've got a whole list of questions here that have been submitted ahead of time. So thank you to all of the listeners that uh, sent those in to me ahead of time. We're also going to be taking some live questions tonight. So I want to be able to use the Q&A function in our webinar. So you can submit your questions through that Q&A function, and that'll show directly to me, and I'll try and work those into our show this evening. So feel free at any point to uh, send in those questions, um, and I'll be taking those. So the other part, uh, before we kind of dive into some of the discussion tonight, I want to allow uh, Danielle Spurley to really talk about some of the opportunities that are coming up here at Bethany Lutheran College for students on this campus to be able to check in on their mental health. Um, my hope is that a lot of college campuses are doing something like this. Um, so reach out to your student counseling center at your campus if you're not here at Bethany uh, to check into some of the potential opportunities you might have for screening um, or talking with a counselor just about where you're at in terms of your mental health. But I'm going to turn things over to Danielle here for just a little bit so she can talk about the mental health screenings uh, that her and the team are going to be doing here at Bethany uh, in the coming week. Danielle? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Coles. Um, we are excited to partner with Bethany to offer free mental health screenings to the students at Bethany Lutheran College on February 1st and 2nd. Um, on the 1st, it's from 4 to 6, and on the 2nd, it's from noon to 2 p.m. Um, and a mental health screening is just basically uh, allows practitioners and students to sit down together. Um, there's some questionnaires that you fill out and then you just talk about any concerns that the students have. So it's not meant to be diagnostic in any way. So the students can kind of do with the information what they want if they want to make an appointment. And, and that's the recommendation of the practitioner. They can do that. Um, or we can also just give suggestions, you know, based on, on what the screening turns out. Um, but it's a good opportunity to just do a little mental health check-in, especially with all the stressors going on recently. Um, and it's it's free. It takes about a half an hour. There's a diagnostic, uh, not a diagnostic, sorry, an assessment piece where students fill out a couple of questionnaires based around basically anxiety and depression symptoms. Um, and then there's an interview portion, too, where they'll have a chance to talk to the practitioners about their results and get some yeah. suggestions. So it's not, it's not just filling out a questionnaire no. and then getting a result back. I mean, there's plenty of inventories online that yep. people can use to kind of check in on that. But this really takes it another step, it seems like, with getting to visit with a professional counselor and kind of talk about those results and um, kind of maybe where some of the areas that are doing well and some of the areas where there's some room for growth or, or need right. for attention. And if there are specific concerns, um, 
that aren't addressed in the in the questionnaire or that are that come out that that you know they want to ask specific questions to you've got a mm -hmm. practitioner there mm -hmm. so about half the time is spent filling out the questionnaire and there's a little bit of intake paperwork because okay. to be able to work with people we have sure. to have their permission um, but then there's also about half of it is spent just talking to yeah. the practitioner okay okay um, and then uh, can you just give those dates and sure, times just absolutely. one more time? Yep, absolutely. Um, and I, th I think that this is up somewhere on Bethany's w website too. But sure, and I'll link that <clears throat> um, in the show notes. Sure. When I post this episode on the podcast, I'll have a link so that people that are listening can go directly to that and yep. see that those dates and times. And there's posters outside our office at 207 Luther Hall. So okay. you can also stop by our office as well. On Monday, February 1st from 4 to 6 p.m., and then Tuesday, February 2nd from 12 to 2 p.m. are the walk-in times. If those times don't work for you, though, you can call our 1-800 number and schedule a screener. You just have to say you're a Bethany student, you're interested in the screenings, but okay. those times don't work for you, and we've got people that will help you get scheduled for a screening. So, yeah, so you don't need an appointment if you're going to come in at one of these times. Correct, yep. Okay. But That's if it's outside of these times, you could still do this screening process. Um, you just have to call or go on the website. Right, so okay. that we make, can make sure we've got a practitioner there ready yeah. to go for you. Yeah, perfect, yep. perfect, yeah. So we'll give that information a little bit later in the show just to revisit as people are kind of popping in uh, throughout our discussion sure. this evening. But, yeah, thank you for that. This is, again, I, I think drawing our attention uh, during the pandemic to monitoring our wellness, paying attention to our mental health. Um, so... That's, that's my hope with our conversation tonight, that people are able to listen, ask some questions, be reflective about this discussion, um, and then take other steps to take care of themselves, whether that's a screening or maybe whether that's uh, doing some of the things that we, we talk about tonight. So that's awesome. All right, so let's dive into our first question for tonight. So I had a, a listener write in talking uh, or asking some questions about time management and productivity. So a listener says, what techniques or advice would you give for students struggling with productivity and time management issues? Specifically, like how can students shift their mindset from being overwhelmed by the tasks they have to complete and then find some contentment in their academic lives. Yeah, maybe I, I could start. Um, and certainly we, we all have different answers that we could give, but maybe just to give like a found, more of a foundational um, answer and a start. I, I think a big thing to do would just have compassion on yourself as a start. Um, and I say that because you're probably not the only one struggling. And I, and what I'm, I don't mean to invalidate your personal struggle because I know students are really struggling, but I, I would say don't get caught up in the mindset that you're failing somehow because things aren't going the way you had planned for this year or you're not getting the things done or, or right, the idea of productivity, you're not feeling productive. And I think we can turn the circumstances of, of everything sort of being chaotic on ourselves as, as if we're the reason we're not getting things done. Um, so I would say start with compassion for yourself and, and grace for yourself and, and just be patient through this time period, which, which is really hard. Obviously, that's not easy to do, but I think it's a place to start. Um, so that's maybe what I would say. Right, yeah, right so, so you're, you're, you're picking up here that the person's feeling like I'm not being productive or I'm not managing my time well, and that's kind of like a reflection on me as a person mm -hmm. and, and then becoming pretty overwhelmed by that. So I don't know, what about that overwhelming part? Like when a student is kind of like looking at this list of things that they have to do or deadlines that are approaching and they're they feeling kind of like panicked or overwhelmed, what kind of things are you typically talking through with, you know, with people when they're, when they're expressing that? It can be overwhelming when you're looking at a whole semester's worth of tasks and to-do lists. And I think starting small is a good thing to kind of get yourself going, you know, break up assignments or um, work on assignments that you know you can accomplish and start kind of peeling away at that one by one. And um, it's progress, not perfection, just working to slowly progress and kind of chip away. And yeah, have compassion for yourselves in those moments where you don't get everything done or you 
um, want to get more done, but you don't have time or you're starting to stress yourself out, you know, kind of working away, chipping little by little. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of uh, chunking is what I'll call it. Um, And and it's like, okay, so I've got like this much and I either uh, think about chunking in terms of volume or time. So like I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to read these next three pages or something. Um, or I'm going to work for the next 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And then in between each of those chunks, I'm going to give myself like a brief little break. I'm going to let myself be distracted. Um, and maybe I'm going to be doodling or I'm going to you know, walk around the room or go get a drink or a snack or something. And then I come back and I work on the next chunk. Um, and it just your, your progress versus perfection comment kind of made me think of that, that that's been a really effective tool for a lot of people just to get started because it's like you're focused too much on the outcome when you're just saying, oh, I've got this huge list and how am I ever going to get this done? Sometimes I even break lists into things I have to do today, things I wish, like these are, like this will make me feel productive, things I wish I could get done or if I get this done I can go to and things that are long term so that I don't forget about them. But like kind of breaking it into even smaller pieces, Mm -hmm. I find can be helpful and more manageable. And then, um, yeah, that that self-compassion part, um, setting time limits, I think can be helpful because in a pre-COVID world, your productivity probably looked a lot different than it does now. So like having grace with yourself and understanding, like if I had my way, I would spend two hours on this assignment, but what I have is four things to do and I have two hours before I normally go to bed. And so like maybe I'm not going to spend as much time as I would, but I'm going to feel better than tomorrow if I, if I take care of myself and get the rest. So like learning to be okay with instead of like the perfection, like this is what I have and, and that's good enough mm-hmm. for right now. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of speaking to the contentment. I don't know, is that where you were going to go? I Joe, was just, ga- just going to maybe add just a little bit, just a thought that popped in my head. Just And just really try not to compare yourself to how someone else is doing. Um, you, you know, we can compare ourselves infinitely, but I think just find a way that works for you and be okay with that. But also don't forget to like, give yourself space to to fill yourself back up, you know, um, cause you can get all the things you need to get done and still be miserable, um, at the end of it. So mm-hmm. just making sure you're actually giving yourself time, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. yeah. So there's like, a uh, almost a myth there. Like if I get everything done, then I'll feel good. And that's, I, th- I mean, I think you just spoke to that, that that's not the case that we aren't filled up by necessarily this outcome that we somehow achieve, um, or don't achieve. But if we can celebrate progress, we can, um, you know, small victories, big victories, just affirm those, that, that's going to give us more energy and motivation moving forward rather than the kind of self-criticism that you guys are, are talking about here. And I can spend, you know, I can stay up all night and do this, but I think sometimes we don't consider, like, at what cost? Mm-hmm. Like, is that worth, are the, are the benefits of that worth the cost yeah. in the long yeah. run? Yeah. When's... I, I won't ask you, but I'll, I'll self-disclose here. I, I'm thinking about when's the last time I pulled an all-nighter? And, and I think it was, I think there was one time in my doc program that I did. I, I, I pulled an all-nighter to, and it was actually, I was like assistant teaching for a professor and all this stuff needed to get graded. And I had no idea how much work it was actually going to be. Because if it was just an assignment for me, I would have probably been like, oh, that's good enough. But because I was doing it for somebody else, I was like, no, I have to. And I pulled, and that was like, I, it was like 5 a.m. and I'm like, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> never. Like, I will just deal with whatever happens. And we'll talk about sleep uh, a little bit later because there are some questions about that um, as well. And I think you know, sleep is such a relevant college yeah. student issue, young adult issue, even outside of the pandemic. But before we move on from this, I, I had found an article on bestcolleges.com. And it was just a really brief article, but the journalist interviewed um, a college freshman about her experience this year. So she's coming into college um, first year right in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and she was like, I, I know that things aren't going to be normal. I know that it's not going to be the typical college experience. But um, she talked about how she has these 
two extremes in her day. On the one hand, she can be completely bored and isolated, just like nothing to do, um, and kind of saying, you know, there's not a lot going on on campus, or or at least as much as there would be um, without COVID, without these restrictions. And then community activities are just super limited as well. And then spending a lot of time alone. But then on the other hand, she can be like this first question, totally stressed and overwhelmed because she talks about feeling disconnected from her professors and her peers, struggling with like financial stressors and just dealing with an online learning environment, so much time on the computer. So what guidance would you give to a student that may be kind of bouncing back and forth? Maybe they're not just in the state of like being overwhelmed, but they're also like totally bored and really struggling with figuring out how to structure their time or, or, or use it meaningfully. You can be thoughtful about it. We're, it's just, we're just talking, so that's fine. That sort of reminds me of like trauma like where you, you, somebody experiences trauma and they can kind of bounce back and forth between being hyper aroused and hypo aroused. Mm -hmm. um, so what you're kind of looking for is that balance, I think, and, and that's what she's kind of struggling with. Um, and as you were reading that, the first thing that kind of popped into my head was grief, right? Like your freshman year or sophomore year, or senior year of college mm -hmm. is probably not looking the way you thought it was. Like if you were a junior last year going into your senior year, you were probably thinking, Whew, this isn't my senior year, but now it's like still lasting. And um, like, I don't know about you guys, but I've had to do a lot of grief processing with people because we don't like always recognize this as grieving, mm -hmm. like that lost year. But I, I think that is important to kind of recognize this is what I'm feeling and give yourself some space for that. Yeah, I wondered, you know, the, the journalist or the, the person um, kind of responding to these questions was using words like bored and lonely, but but I wondered about, yeah, like grief or like just feeling empty. Like I don't have this like clear direction or I don't have this clear connection with things. And um, I don't know, what what have your guys' experiences been in working on, on the college campus with dealing with loss, dealing with, well, you know, my expectations were this, but reality is this. I mean, that's exactly what I was going to get at is the expectations versus reality. Coming in freshman year, you have such high expectations and you probably hear about it from friends and family members of what to expect or even professors, teachers. And then to have it just be nothing like that, um, it's shocking. You know, it's been coming into a place, maybe you don't know anyone, have no connections, and it's hard to make those connections when you're not having the the resources to do so anymore and just managing that and try as you might there's still a lot of barriers there yeah i, I think about just fomo you know like fear of missing out um i think the world's sort of just we've been um we've been forced to just be in a state of, of fomo and so yeah, just to build off that, just really f focus on finding that balance and, and finding just the little nuggets that you can take um, in the day that were good. Um, and really, and it, it, this isn't easy, you know, and we're all, I mean, we, I think all of us here struggle with, with this these exact things. So um, I think that's important to say, but just being able to shift your mindset of like, okay, this is where I'm at now. This isn't where I will always be. God willing, of course. Um, but how can I make where I am the best I can for this year, or this semester? Um, and certainly, it's a harder task than than um, than it seems. But I think if you can kind of keep your focus on that sort of mindset, I, I think can be helpful again. And that's like a foundational thing, I suppose. Mm -hmm. It's not like mm -hmm. a what can I do? What kind of things can I do? Mm -hmm. um, but I think you can start there, and that certainly makes things more helpful. Yeah. Um, so we have a live question that kind of piggy, piggybacks on that. Um, so the question is, um, how do we get out of that bad pattern of negative thinking strategy for this? A, a way of really like 
shifting that mindset. So we know, okay, that's important. Our perspective is important, how we're viewing things. Or, but we get kind of caught up in this negative cycle that kind of feeds back in on itself. So what, what tools or strategies are, are you guys kind of walking uh, students through when they're dealing with that? Awareness is obviously the first most important piece. If you're not aware that you're in this cycle, it's hard to stop it. So becoming aware that, hey, this is happening, these are the thoughts that I'm having, and it's unproductive, it's unhealthy for me, that in itself is like a, a good way to start implementing positivity. It's just knowing that it has to, has to start. I have people, I do two things and they seem kind of opposites, but I think both are important. So one of them is like specifically name your feeling and be honest about it. Like you, like sometimes I think as Christians and it's not a bad thing, but we think we always have to be positive. Otherwise we're disappointing people or we're not living our faith. But the truth is life is hard sometimes. And so like acknowledging that and giving yourself some space to be sad about things that are sad, like a senior year, that's not what you expect it to be, I think is really important. So like naming what you're actually feeling and giving yourself some space. But then I like radical acceptance from DBT. So the idea that it may not be what I would choose and I may not like it, but this is the reality in front of me. So at some point then I have to kind of accept mm -hmm. this reality and move forward. Mm -hmm. um, and you can work, like think about like ways to reclaim. Um, with trauma, you look at like reclaiming pieces of your life that trauma has changed, mm -hmm. like w in what ways can you reclaim kind of the uh, the social engagement? So it may not look the way you wanted it to, but like, can you have one friend over in a mask? <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, if th those are the college rules, mm -hmm. can you have one friend in yeah. your dorm room in a mask so you can play Uno together for half an hour? Like, yeah. that's something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, um, well, a, a recent guest on the podcast was um, talking about how so much of our, our dialogue has been dominated by what we're told no about, mm -hmm. right? All of the things that were being said, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. And that, that like at some point, all of us have that little adolescent still that just kind of wants to be like, I don't want to, I don't want to listen. I'm not going to do that. So, so the, um, the guest was really talking about how can we get to yes? And what, what can we say yes to? Um, and so when, Typically, when I'm, I'm seeing somebody and they're kind of in that negative tunnel vision or just that circular negative pattern, part of getting out of that is stepping back and n not just focusing on the no's, but also trying to see the yeses. Um, what, what can I do? What do I have control over in this situation? Um, because I think it, it, it's going to elevate all of our anxiety when we're just focused on these things that that we don't have control over and kind of dwelling on that. I don't know, do you guys have other thoughts on that? Kind of shifting away from the negative mindset? I, I would say maybe be really um, conscious of, of what you're consuming maybe, um, whether it be social media or, or any other thing that you're taking in. Um, you know, it, obviously that doesn't always have to be a factor, but I think it plays a big role in keeping us, and that's kind of building off what you said, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it can keep us in that negative mindset, and we can get very stuck in that when we're consuming things that we're not really taking account of necessarily, um, whether it be social media or, you know, Netflix or or what we're reading or what we're doing with our time as well. Um, so... I think that's important to just keep in mind. And yeah. just, just, again, take an outside view of kind of where you're at with things and um, not be critical of yourself, but just kind of work towards understanding in that way. So let's let's pause there. Let's go into that. There was a, another listener question that was submitted actually about social media, and I think this is a good place to address that. So as a, as a society, we can see both the benefits and the downsides of social media. What's your personal philosophy on social media use? And what would be your advice to students struggling with toxicity, negativity on social media, especially in the midst of the pandemic, where I think people are spending more time there trying to connect, but 
yeah, it's a lot of negativity. So I guess, first of all, just what's your personal philosophy on social media? That, that's the first question. I don't know. I think it's, there's pros and cons, and you're going to be able to find in your world both pros and cons. Yeah. Um, pros in this world we live in right now is the connection piece. We're able to connect with one another easier. Um, con is the, it can be toxic, it can be consuming, it can um, create this perception of how you're supposed to be doing, what you're supposed to be doing, how you're supposed to be living. Um, and I would just say be mindful of what you're consuming, how much, if it's mindless, are you mindlessly doing that? And how could you better fill that time if it is mindless? Um, and just keeping that like a something that you're trying to monitor for yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love that idea of using social media with intention, mm -hmm. right? That it's so easy to just pull out the phone and just scroll through Instagram and see. And then, you know, you're faced with whatever pops up, right? You don't have any control over what other people are posting or what's kind of going on in their lives or, you know, bigger platforms that you might be following, what they're kind of gripe of the day might be but if you go on with intention like oh i'm going to message this person or i'm going to post about this thing going on with intent is a way of reclaiming some of that control in that environment other thoughts on like personal philosophies on social media i don't know i i'm a, kind of a scrooge when it comes to social media so <laughs> well that's honest. maybe i shouldn't say anything but <laughs> go for uh, it go for it yeah um it's tough i think I think maybe one thing I'll say is kind of off that idea of it, it's not it's not a passive thing, and so um, I think we we oftentimes like I need a break, so I'm just gonna scroll for a little bit, um, or I'm just gonna look at this thing. Um, and it, while it feels passive, it's not like things are happening in your brain, and it, it's shaping how you see yourself and how you see the world. Um, and it, it doesn't do the same thing for you chemically that something that's actually beneficial for you does. Um, and again, I, I don't want to just rag on social media. I'm not a huge fan. I try to stay very far away. But you, I'm not You, you had I'm not full saying, disclosure. You're a Scrooge about it. That's okay. I'm not okay. saying everyone has to do that. But I think yeah. I, and certainly what Ashley said, there's pros and cons, but I think like ask yourself what, what you would really lose if you just kind of shut off for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, how would it actually impact you? And does does social media really give you what it thinks what you think it gives you? Does it really benefit you more than more than it takes away from you? I think. Yeah. And, but really, just sit down. It's not it's not a passive thing like we thought it is. And I think that that documentary, what was it? Um, oh, on the social say, dilemma, yeah, right? Yeah, I think that was dilemma. that was eye opening mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Um, and so I, I'm not don't want anybody to be scared. Um, but just mm. be but the bots thoughtful. are out there. Yeah, no. be thoughtful. About it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I um, I think it's a tool that can be used. One of the books that I really like to use with clients is on resiliency, and one of the charts on there um, has you kind of evaluate: Are you using social media to connect? Because that's what it's supposed to be for, right? Is to to make connections and keep connections. Are you actually using it to connect, or is it actually isolating you? So. Mm you kind of step back and evaluate like the different pieces of it. Like, are you actually using the tool the way it's you want it to, or is it, is it starting to use you Yeah, a little bit? So, yeah. Can I share a quick story? So I don't, <clears throat> I'm not on a ton of social media, but I do have Instagram and I enjoy that. And that's, it's been, um, just a positive way for me to connect with people that I don't live close to anymore and just stay in contact. And, um, but, during the uh, the lead up, th like through the election cycle and voting, I got uh, um, invited, like through Instagram, to participate in a research study, and I I checked it out. It was legit, like, and it's actually a a, a research organization that I've actually consumed some of their research. It's good stuff, and so um, I was like, "Yep, I'm going to do this." And part of doing the being a participant was not just answering questions and filling out surveys, but they actually deactivated my Instagram account. And I went either in a hopper of one week or four weeks. 
And I was really kind of hoping for the four-week hopper because they were paying me $25 a week to have my account deactivated. But um, I ended up in the one-week hopper, and that was fine. And, like, one day, it was just random. It was, like, on a Tuesday afternoon. I went on um, to go on Instagram, and it was, like, psh- it was, I was logged out. I was like, oh, it started now. Okay. So I went the whole week, no, no Instagram. I didn't, you know, turn it back on or anything like that. But what I found was that when I got access back, I had, I made a decision. I wasn't going to have it first of all on my home screen on my phone. Um, I, I just put it down like in the apps below. So I actually have to like search for it, go to it to access it. So it's not just turn on my phone in one click. Um, and I have dramatically decreased my time on Instagram. Not that I was spending a ton, but it's noticeable, like, how much time just by hiding it on my phone and not having it right there. So um, I think that's that was just something that was pretty eye-opening for me because I think it had in some ways turned into that mindless scrolling or kind of filling time. And, yeah, that kind of initial purge of, like, I'm not doing it at all for a week and then coming back to it with boundaries is something that then I've tried to implement with some uh, students and clients as well. Is like, why don't you just stop and see what it feels like? Like, just don't use it for a week. And then when you come back to it, you get to decide what those boundaries are. So, so that's my personal philosophy. That's, that's how I've approached it. Um, all right. So let's, uh, change gears a little bit. Here's a a very mental health focused question that was submitted uh, by a listener. And the question starts this way, how much of our mental health is predestined? Um, Individual says, I'm someone who struggles with bouts of depression, but I take a lot of steps to improve my mental health. I exercise regularly. That's fantastic. I try to sleep at least seven hours a night. That's great too. Eat well, take vitamins and supplements to fill in the cracks that I miss with my macronutrients. Um, I've also experimented with meditation and try to pray often. But despite all my efforts, there are still times when I struggle or have bouts of depression. So let's talk a little bit about is our mental health predestined? Is that just something that's like hardwired into us um, from the get-go? Let's start there and then we can talk a little bit about um, approaches to, to managing and coping with depression. So what are your guys' thoughts on this? <laughs> Not to be a Midwestern, Midwestern but hoof the. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's that nature versus nurture thought. And um, it that's a tough conversation to have because there's no true answer almost. Um, it's individualized. It's unique to everyone and your experiences with it is going to look different to someone else you know you could be doing all the quote-unquote right things and none of them be working and there's not a good answer for why yeah yeah so this nature versus nurture let's let's go with that a little bit um because i think our mental health has some biological components to it, um, whether it's depression or ADHD, autism, um, you know, a bipolar disorder, like all of these have some biological underpinnings to it. That's, and that's why they respond to medication. But, but I don't think that's the whole story. I don't know. What are your guys' thoughts when it comes to maybe the nurture part with our mental health? Yes, I'm, I'm going to be thinking out loud here, so this isn't going to be a fully constructed. Let's do um, it. Think out loud. I love it. <laughs> a, a fully constructed answer. Um, again, what kind of what Ashley said? It, it's it's so complex, right? It's it was it was a question that people were fighting and wrestling with. You know, it's, it's nature, it's nurture, and it's like actually it's both, um, and it's a very complex thing. Um, sometimes more favoring nature and sometimes more favoring nurture. Um, like you said, with some of those mental health diagnoses that seem to be driven more by biology, sometimes it can be, um, you know, it can be things that are outside of biology that activate them, like trauma or stress or something like that. 
Um, and maybe whereas if they hadn't experienced those things, they wouldn't have experienced the biological effects. Um, and so, right, and, but that's just some of the time. Um, sometimes people experience depression b because of loss or because, you know, maybe experience depression because of COVID, right, and, and the depression that that brings, and then it subsides after things have been worked through and things have changed. Um, but then if certainly you get you get some people who who it just comes right and mm -hmm. and I would say to this person not that I'm assuming that they feel feel guilt but again to, and I'll sound like a broken record but to have the compassion on yourself to say I'm doing all these things and my life's a certain way so I shouldn't feel depressed I hear that a lot and um you know, I'm not making a comparison necessarily. It's just an example. But in the in the same vein of someone who maybe was born, um, you know, with, with without an arm or who had lost an arm, uh, mm -hmm. I would never want that person to feel like they have it. it it's a internal thing that has become wrong with them, yeah, or mm -hmm. something that they added to, or or certainly. You know, obviously that's a whole nother conversation, but um, yeah. So I, I don't know if that makes sense. I, mm -hmm. I'll stop there because mm -hmm. the thought mm -hmm. is sort of ended, and I don't want to just ramble. <laughs> that's okay. But that's, that's okay. Yeah. Do you want to pick up that train, Danielle? Well, not that train. No. Okay. <laughs> you can go it was a good train. I think Joe did a great job. Yeah. By himself. I would. You know, the you mentioned the word predestination, and I. You know, I think we can be predisposed to certain. Mm. Um, mental health, physical health issues, yeah. Yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get them or that, like, God, w like, that's what he, w you know, <laughs> wants for our life or he's punishing us. Like, that's that's not really the case. But we certainly genetically can be predisposed to certain things. That doesn't mean that we can't, you know, work on them. Like, it mm -hmm. sounds like this person is doing, like... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think of introversion and extroversion. I'm, I'm an introvert and I, I appreciate being around friends. I, I am a social person, but I'm, the truth is I'm never going to get my batteries recharged by being around big groups of people. Yeah. It's just not who I am. So like kind of accepting that piece of myself that this is just like part of who I am and figuring out ways to like embrace that while figuring out how to be with my friends and be social in ways that are comfortable for me, I think are important. But also you kind of got to give yourself some, some space to like, this is a sad world <laughs> and, and yeah. depression is going to happen to like sincere, good Christians sometimes yeah. too. So I think yeah. we can carry some guilt about that. But like, like if you look historically through um, he the heroes of faith, you hear depression, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Certainly um, with Elijah, certainly with Paul. I think. Even David, mm -hmm. you know, when Saul is, is pursuing him in the Psalms, you hear him crying out to the Lord, and yeah. there's some depression there. So yep. um, that doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong. It just means, like, maybe it's a hard time in your life, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. I think, um, <clears throat> so my initial thought was, I wonder what things would be like if this person wasn't doing those activities and really being very intentional with taking care of themselves, I think, oh, like how much worse things might be. So it's not that, um, it's not that it's not doing anything, but it probably is doing quite a bit yeah. to, to benefit. Um, and I notice that a lot of them are very, um, physically based, right? It's very action oriented. And I, I love that too, because I think when we're doing that helps activate, you know, motivation and energy and, and kind of mobilizes us. Um, but just kind of circling back to like mindset too, I think is important. And one of the things um, that, that happens with depression is that uh, we end up feeling some feelings of hopelessness. We're kind of looking to the future, or looking to the present um, and, and not, not really seeing much good. And so I, oft, I often find that we have to be very intentional with um, creating space to focus on the positive. And one of the ways that I love to do that is through gratitude. And I'll, I'll say, okay, let's even just today, let's just start with a 
basic gratitude list. You know, let's put one or two things that you're grateful for today to kind of, again, gradually shift that focus out of kind of that depressive thinking and into a space that's, you know, maybe going to help balance that out a little bit. It's not that gratitude is a antidote, but gratitude, when we're in states of gratitude, that also has a biological impact on our brain chemistry as well. So I think there's a lot of good that can come out of that. I think this person's doing a lot of the right things. Have some self-compassion, be patient, understand that, you know, we're living in a fallen world and in fallen bodies. And so nature, nurture, all of that's going to impact us. But um, yeah, keep working hard. Well, and praise, right? So mm-hmm. as a Christian, like happiness can be fleeting, but God is God and his characteristics don't change. And there's always reason like there to, I can always praise. And I think that changes mindset too, along with gratitude. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Okay. So, all right. All right. Let's talk a little bit about, um, some stress here. So there's a concern with increased use of denial or disengagement behaviors to cope with stress during the pandemic. So what adaptive or or like functional coping skills do you guys recommend students use to positively impact their mental wellness? So I think, um, I think some of the, I'm just expanding on this a little bit, like disengagement or denial, sometimes that can turn into like, I'm, I'm seeking something to make me feel better in this moment maybe take my mind off of the things that I'm stressed about. Sometimes that can be alcohol. Sometimes that can be substances. Sometimes that can be, um, you know, gaming or streaming services or those kind of things. Um, So that really just leads to avoidance and disengagement. Um, So when, when you're, when you see a student kind of struggling with some of those patterns of behavior, what, is, what are some of the ways that you're trying to guide them into more adaptive coping to deal with that stress? Um, well, it's, it's going to sound stupid and simple, but just to, to have them re-engage themselves in their own bodies and, and with others, I would say. Um, yeah, talk about how, how to do that. How do you re-engage with yeah, your body? Yeah, no, I, I think you have to be intentional about it. You have to, I mean, I think the biggest thing is that to take the time to do it, it's hard to just stop and say like, how am I, where am I at? Um, and, and our brains are very good at doing that, right? That we're very good at like finding something that helps us cope. And then we just do that. And we, we totally forget about ourselves. So, it, right. You might be really stressed and you don't even realize it. And the first thing you do is just go to some sort of substance or, or any other thing, fill in the mm-hmm. blank. Um, mm-hmm. And so kind of breaking that cycle a little bit by just checking in with yourself and be like, where am I at? Um, how am I actually feeling? Um, but, then, but then starting to, again, re-engage with your body. Um, you know, like, and it sounds so stupid, uh, but to, just to focus on your breathing, like how, how big that can be. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a whole lot of research on what breathing can do and um, things like that meditation i heard right Mm -hmm. prayer um Mm -hmm. relaxation things of any kind you know i you know we could give thousands of examples so that's not help not maybe the most helpful to just talk Mm -hmm. about necessarily but Mm -hmm. um and i would say engage with others Mm um and i know it's hard Mm -hmm. when we want to step back and disengage from people when we want to isolate but i (laughs) i think we kind of got to work and force ourselves sometimes mm-hmm. to be out. Um, mm-hmm. and that, again, that's that mindset slowly changes. I yeah. Think, but yeah. yeah. Um, that makes me just think of like, sometimes you say, I'm just going to do this for 20 minutes. So maybe it's going to talk to a friend or, or meet up with somebody or, you know, go down to the cafe and, you know, have dinner with somebody like, I'm just going to go for 20 minutes. And if I'm not feeling better after 20 minutes, or I'm not feeling like I want to stay there. Okay, then I leave. But at least I tried, you know, I did something in that in that instance that was intentional rather than um, I'll use the word reflexive. Like, I think that's what you were talking about is like, we just do these things automatically without even really checking in or thinking about ourselves. And so, um, yeah, I, I love that. What, what other kinds of more adaptive coping skills are you, you helping guide students toward to manage their stress? 
I mean, I was completely along the same lines of when you're wanting to disengage and isolate and go to unhealthy coping mechanisms just to kind of fight that urge and to be aware of it, that it's happening and fight it and do the opposite of what you're, you want to isolate. Try and force yourself to do the opposite of that and reach out to people um, and ask for that help, even if it's not directly saying, hey, I need help. Say, hey, you want to go grab a coffee, you know, and fighting that urge to isolate. I also try and encourage students instead of taking like a judgmental stance to try and like have some curiosity about like why am I having trouble engaging? Like if you can be curious about that instead of judgmental, that often leads to better results because you know, if you think about people that you open up to, they're usually non judgmental people. So um, being curious about why you're reacting the way you're reacting can be helpful. And yeah, those check-ins I think are really important. Like mm -hmm. even as, an, as a therapist, like at the end, like we kind of have our blocks. So mm -hmm. at the end of each, I, I do, I've gotten used to kind of checking in, like if my anxiety is high, even if I'm going to be a couple minutes late for a po an appointment, maybe I get up and walk through the office and get a glass of water because I, I know that that's what I need to just kind of reset. Mm -hmm. So those frequent check-ins with yourself and, and taking care of yourself, because if you keep pushing, you know, you get to seven or eight o'clock at night and you don't have a f infinite amount of coping. Like if you've used all of it up and then it's seven o'clock and you've got this huge paper to write, you've got nothing left for it. So mm -hmm. by taking smaller breaks and, and taking care of yourself throughout the day, that can make a huge difference in kind of your stamina too. Yeah. Well, and I would say just quick, cause I, I, I could hear people maybe who are listening, if there's anybody out there listening, um, <laughs> Just like, yeah, yeah we, we want We've it. got a good audience. We, we want it. We want to yeah. engage with people, but we can't because of everything going on. So I, I totally get that. And it's not, right now, it's not as easy to just say, well, yeah, just go hang out with people or go go meet up with someone. Um, and so I get that. And, and it, it's, it's hard for all of us, again, right? Just like Daniil said, we, we have to do the same things as counselors. Um, we're humans too, and it, and it, and it happens. But you know, th I think that's where technology can be beneficial, like when used in a correct way. Like, you know, maybe call someone you haven't called in a while or or actually really s Skype with someone. You know, I, I know people do that a lot. So, um, and it's not the same as being in person. So, again, just giving yourself the space to be like, it's not always going to be this way, um, but really finding ways I can fight the urge to disengage. I've I've seen some really creative ways that people have used technology to connect and like actually do things together and maybe that's you know even playing like old school like board games or card games like online being able to do that I think there's some good apps for that um, and platforms for that um, I've also heard of uh, virtual dinner parties where they have a recipe and everybody's connecting through their Zoom and then they all make the same meal together and they're kind of in their kitchen cooking and hanging out. But yeah, it's through Zoom, so you, you do miss that in person, but it's still coming together and joining in something that I think is meaningful. So I think there's lots of creative ways um, to, to try and still connect in spite of, again, just getting to yes finding things that we can do rather than the things that we feel like we can't. Yeah. You mentioned old school, um, you know, like as a team, maybe you can't get together and have dinners like you used to, but like what, what would, I wonder what it would be like to like write a personal note with like an encouraging quote and just like send it in, in the like campus meal to everybody mm -hmm. on the team. Mm -hmm. Like having a handwritten note, I keep, I don't know about you guys, but I keep those things. So like sometimes going old school mm -hmm. <laughs> can be even even more encouraging and more meaningful think yeah. of that you know so yeah. like getting creative and like sending notes through campus mail to your friends like hey thinking about you like that awesome. can make the difference in somebody's day and I, I think you know you mentioned um before um that negative loop in one of the questions I think mm -hmm. you know when when you disengage and you're using avoidance that definitely feeds into that kind of mm -hmm. negative loop because then you start thinking I can't even engage with this you know I didn't I didn't wasn't in this class today I didn't get the assignment done like that can really spiral very quickly and then you disengage further because you think people are judging you but the truth is everybody's struggling right now and and um 
you know, th- making the assumption mm-hmm. that other people are going to judge you for not getting something done is probably not accurate. Like yeah. a lot of people are understanding because mm-hmm. they're struggling too. So totally fighting those assumptions that, that mm-hmm. feed into that negative loop, I think mm-hmm. can be productive too. Okay. We're at 719, so we got about 11 minutes left. And there's another question I want to get to here from a listener. Um, and this is actually kind of about student athletes. And that's not, that you know, again, that's a specific population of students on campus. But I think other people will be able to relate and connect with this. So um, the question starts this way. As we continue to push forward with athletics, many of our teams are testing COVID testing multiple times per week. And unfortunately, many have gone through plenty of shutdowns and subsequent startups due to COVID infections or close contacts, so quarantining um, when they are near a positive patient. So these situations, this back and forth, have been extremely mentally and physically taxing for all the, everybody involved, athletes, coaches, medical staff, even administration. What are some coping strategies to help during these difficult times of like, oh, I get to do this. Oh, no, I don't get to do this, right? This kind of back and forth that, that students are experiencing. Um, so we'll, there's kind of two parts to this question, but we'll start there. Just, again, coping with that uncertainty and like thinking, oh, I'm going to get to do it, and then I can't. What I think that extends beyond athletics. I know um, I experienced some of that. My my boys have experienced some of that, and in high school with their athletics. So, I don't know. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Hmm. You can be thoughtful. Yeah, yeah. you can be thoughtful. That's fine. Yeah, I, I get it. Well, I, I I don't get it, but as a as an athlete myself, um, I would be pretty bummed. Um, and and we've said this a lot, and it doesn't seem like an answer that's going to be actually helpful. So I get like why this might sound frustrating, but really, again, shifting how you see that opportunity. Um, certainly, college sports and sports in general, and the same could go with arts, right? I know the people in the arts are going through the same struggles, right? They're losing those opportunities as well. Mm-hmm. But I think all of those opportunities are are not really givens, right? I, I think we've seen that this year. And I think we're, as a, as a modern society, we're used, we're very used to be, being able to just kind of do all those things and not even really think about it. Um, that just have, we're, we're blessed to have the time in our day to be able to give ourselves to those things. Um, and again, when they're taken away, then it's like, well, this is, this is like a, this is like a need I have or a, and so to shift it from a need to sort of like, this is an opportunity that I have. And so if I, if I look at it as an opportunity, it, it's not something that I've necessarily lost that is um, something I need. Um, uh, and so and I would say for, for athletes or for people in the arts, um, whether you're doing studio art or you're in theater or, um, or you're doing music, to just not be focused on your identity in that singular way um, because you're so much more than one thing that you do. And I, and again, I don't want to devalue that because the arts, sports are awesome and they bring a lot of meaning into our lives. But don't let yourself be stuck in this is all I do and this is all I am because I think that can produce, well, now what do I have? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, again, that that's not like, okay, what's going to fix all the COVID procedures that we have to go to in the back and forth? I think, again, if you can keep that mindset, I think it can be a little less impactful. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I love that so much more than being singularly defined by one thing. And and again, those are beautiful things. And I love that you said that. So I just, I'm going to let that sit. I think that's awesome, Joe. Other thoughts on, yeah, just coping with this, this back and forth. I think kind of an earlier note that we made of focusing on what you can't do, switching that mindset to focus on what you can do. You know, we have a lot of things right now that we can't control, and that's one of them, all of those procedures and quarantining and all of that. We we really can't control that. And 
instead switching that mindset, what can I control in this situation? What can I do self-care wise to control in this situation to manage that? Um, that's kind of what comes to mind for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other part of this question then um, is at what point do all these like intensive protocols just become like too much? And maybe it's in the best interest to just like pause and just say, you know, we're not going to do this back and forth anymore. We're just going to stop and, and just wait, you know, and I think we saw some of that like last year, um, early on during the pandemic where things shut down and it was like, okay, that's just canceled. We're not even going to try and do that. But now, because I think this has been going on for so long, there's a sense of urgency to say, we, we want to get back to these things. Um, and I think we know that it's probably good for our mental health, like to re-engage in life, to do the things that we're passionate about. Um, but yeah, I don't know, rather than pushing forward with everything to say, okay, we're, we are actually just going to stop and there isn't going to be this back and forth. I don't know if you have any insights or thoughts on that. Well, I'm, we kind of alluded to this before, but this is a really tough situation. You know, usually administration adults like have an answer, but this is kind of unprecedented, totally. at least in our time. So yeah, there is totally no guidebook. And so, for us. you know, I, I talk to administrators, you know, at colleges frequently, and I know they are hurting and frustrated too, and really like want to give the students the best experience that they have and, and that like is very difficult for them. So, I mean, I know, I'm sure students know this, but they don't make decisions like this lightly. And I think they are trying to do the best that they can with what they've got. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so kind of taking a step back and like every, like you're hurting. So sometimes your hurt gets in the way of understanding, like other people are hurting too. And, and like, it's not the situation that you want, but um, people are trying to make the best, do the best, yeah. With what they have. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think everybody's trying to do the right. best that they can and um, wanting to provide those opportunities, not just take it away, but but it is very, very stressful. Well, and, you know, it's okay for students to be disappointed. It's disappointing to practice all week and then suddenly not be able to mm -hmm. play a game. Like, mm -hmm. that's super disappointing. And, yeah. and I think everybody kind of recognizing the hurt, <laughs> you know, that that people are feeling and giving, giving people some space for that, I think is important too. Cool. Ah, uh, is there enough? Oh, I, I don't need to say anything. Is there okay. Enough time? <laughs> well, we, yeah, we have about three minutes and I had a, I have a listener here reminding me that I said we were going to talk about sleep and we haven't. Oh. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, we do need to talk a little bit about sleep. Um, so, I, I, it kind of falls into this um, studying on the effects of the pandemic on college students. So we've already said, um, you know, college is just a hard time to get good sleep, period. Um, but right now in a, a recent study that came out, 86% of participants um, indicated that they were experiencing disrupted sleep. And 38%, and almost 40% were saying that that disruption was severe. So what can students do to address sleep issues, you know, things like insomnia, or maybe it's the other way, hypersomnia, where we're just like sleeping for really long periods of time, but not getting good rest, um, or just poor quality sleep. What are your, what are your sleep tips? I think like a routine at bedtime so that you're signaling to your body that it's time to like shut down. And so... Like I, I like routines of like, I don't know, whatever your routine is going to be. They say like 20 to 30 minutes away, like before bed, put screens away. I don't know if that's possible for, for college students because I know a lot of their lives are, are on screens. But, um, you know, coming up with a routine that's relaxing, maybe it's, you know, um, shutting computer down and, and doing something that you find relaxing, like watching a show to wind, I, I don't know, whatever it's going to be to wind down and then like having like some type of a routine to let your body and mind know that it's, that it is time to, to shut down. And I think mm -hmm. sleep hygiene is really important, like not mm -hmm. working on your bed and mm -hmm. which yeah. gets hard in a Ta dorm room. Yeah. Talk about, <laughs> talk about sleep hygiene, because I think that, um, 
at least when I've introduced that term to people, that's not always immediately familiar. They don't ex- like sleep hygiene. Like, you mean I should take a shower before I go to bed? Well, maybe, but that's not really what it's about. Can you, can you expand on that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, it's just doing things that are going to make your s- sleep easier for you. So um, shutting down screens is can be part of it. I'm trying to remember my sheet. Mm-hmm. Can you guys help me out? Do you uh, talk about sleep hygiene with your clients? Go ahead. Yeah, you go. I think of uh, when we're all at home all the time, where are you spending your time? And spending your time all day in bed, it's not super helpful for you when you're trying to then sleep. Your body, your mind gets kind of confused during that. Um, when you eating in bed or working in bed, doing homework, studying, yeah. that can get very confusing for your mind. So creating separate spaces as much as you can for that helps with better sleep mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and having a dark room and you know a, a quiet place and I know that gets really tricky in a dorm room so like maybe you have a sound machine that you play or you have um, certain music that signals to you there's like bedtime stories for adults now and like mm-hmm. all kinds of things oh, like yeah. tools that you can yeah. use or yep. maybe you do a, like a, a body scan um, you listen to a body scan to help you. A body scan basically um, asks you to notice your breathing and then notice different parts of your body, like notice the sensations in your feet, and you kind of breathe into and out of your feet and then mm-hmm. your legs. And mm-hmm. So it helps you notice sensations, and it's relaxing. So maybe like incorporating that into like a bedtime routine. Yeah. 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 I'm, I, uh, am fascinated by the, the sleep stories that have come out. You know, it's like I read uh, stories to my kids at bedtime almost every night that I'm home and that it helps them like calm down. And now there's adult bedtime stories. Um, they call them sleep stories, not bedtime, but I actually yeah. have, think you have a good voice for that. So <laughs> okay. Well, you start I would start, start recording those. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, the the thing that I would uh, add to that, and I know we're at seven thirty one, so we're going to finish up here pretty soon, but, um, Sometimes when we're focused on getting better sleep, we're almost like hyper-focused on sleep, but we're not focused on the other part of that circadian rhythm, which is being awake and alert. And so some of the things that we can do for ourselves is like when we get up in the morning, like open up the blinds, like get some natural light in. If we're up, you know, even even when the sun is still kind of low on the horizon, it doesn't have to be right when it's rising. I mean, it's great if you're up that early, but um, some people aren't. But even when the sun is still on the horizon, that, that light, um, our body responds to that. And everything starts turning on and, like, getting ready for alertness and awakeness. And that's the other part of the sleep cycle that... Sometimes people that are having trouble sleeping are so fatigued during the day that their activity level is really low. Maybe they are in bed a lot or they take naps or something like that. We don't, you know, there's some science behind naps too that we can talk about another time. But, um, but I think when, when it's day, when you're, when you're up and you're awake, be active, like be, get some sunlight, even in the Midwest when it's cold and dark like still be outside even for five to ten minutes early in the morning to get that sunlight is really going to help um, set you up for the day so that when the sun goes down and it's dark then your body's going to respond to that as well and say oh now it is time for me to sleep so just I think restoring some of that circadian rhythm be a active and alert during the day and unwind at night having some good rituals routines um to help yourself fall asleep. I think getting up to, like, if you are having problems, like not laying in bed and gr- letting that frustration mount because mm-hmm. the more you get frustrated with yourself, the less likely you are to sleep. Mm-hmm. So, like, getting up and reading a book or mm-hmm. doing something that doesn't ideally involve screens yeah. Um, yeah. so that you can relax and yep. tell yourself, you know, I may not get good sleep tonight, but that mm. doesn't mean I can't tomorrow or whatever. And, and maybe this is a little, um, I don't know, uh, uh, like untherapeutic or something, but I'm actually okay. Like if somebody is waking up a lot during the night, like, okay, turn on Netflix, like pull that up on your phone or your TV or something, and then just watch something that you don't really care about. And like you kind of will start to get, dozy while you're doing that and then just 
turn it off and try and go back to sleep. But you're right, just kind of laying in bed, clock watching, tossing and turning, that's not helpful because you get more frustrated. So I'm like, yeah, I'd love it if you read a book, but I, don't, I guess I don't have to, I'm, I'm not um, too confident that that's always going to happen. So I'm like, yeah, just turn on, you know, an office episode of The Office and then, you know, just fall asleep to that. That'll, the Office is kind of therapeutic anyway, I think. All right. You guys have been awesome tonight. I've really enjoyed this. There were more questions that we didn't quite get to. That's okay. Um, it just means we should do this again in the future sometime. Um, so appreciate all of your time and your expertise. Um, I hope that it's been valuable for our audience. Again, I'm going to post um, this uh, video. I'm going to be able to put that up on YouTube. Um, in the next few days. And then I'm also going to take the audio and publish that on the podcast platform. You can find that on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, really any platform that you like to listen to podcasts on. So this will be uh, the new episode for um, the podcast on Monday next week. Uh, so we have the Bethany screenings coming up. Um, what are the dates for those? Monday, February 1st from 4 to 6, and then Tuesday, February 2nd from 12 to 2 so, at Bethany. Yep. So if you're a Bethany student, please take advantage of that. If you're at a different college um, or institution, please check out the resources that are available for you to be able to check in on your mental health. All right. Thank you. And until next time, be well. <laughs>